Can, can you show us some of the things that can be done? Yes, we'll show you the, the most unethical situation. <laughs> okay. Um, we'll take the shot of the uh, Nancy and Ron and um, I'm going to place myself into this photograph and using this type of technology you can easily get things to pop right in. And in this case you're going to become the third member of the party. Yes. So let's just paste in. While you do this, this is something that you're doing for fun and you can continue um, punching your buttons that you need to do um, while we watch the, the photo come up. Mm -hmm. One thing to do it for fun, another thing to change the photo itself and there you are. And then I can pop yourself right in. This is one of the earliest demos of Photoshop, before it became the juggernaut it is today. In the 20 plus years since then, Photoshop managed to change the landscape of design, photography and visual effects. Its popularity has grown so big that the software's name is now being used as a verb, similar to how googling something is the equivalent of searching on the internet. Much to Adobe's uh, chagrin since they're facing the real possibility of losing Photoshop's trademark, but that's a whole other story. Photoshop nowadays is being used for pretty much everything, from book covers to VFX and astronomy. So let's dive into the world of Photoshop and what made it the giant it is today. Photoshop was brought to life in 1988 by two brothers, Thomas and John Knoll. As Thomas was working on his PhD thesis, he wrote several image processing tools, which he later shared with his brother John. John Knoll was already working at ILM, so he immediately saw the possibilities of having a tool that can digitally manipulate images. They started bouncing ideas off of each other, and in a matter of months they had an initial toolset that could do a lot of exciting things for the time, like making selections in a semi-automatic way with the magic wand, or color adjustments, making feather selections, and much more. Back then, these types of adjustments were only possible with really expensive equipment. Uh, there were systems that did many of these same things, but they were very expensive, dedicated hardware. There's SciTech and, and um, SciTex and Crossfield systems that you could go to a, a graphics prepress house and you could rent time on them. And I remember the uh, SciTex system. Uh, I got a quote once that it was that it was uh, nine hundred dollars an hour to use. And you had to have an operator running it for you. So you sat over his shoulder and told him what you wanted to do. So the big revolution here is that, that you had all the same power that you had in a side tech system, but this is something that can be run by yourself on commodity hardware. Even though version 1 wasn't nearly as powerful or as feature rich as uh, what Photoshop is today, the basics were already there. And just by looking at that first version, we can already tell that this is Photoshop. The toolbar on the left and the icons are the dead giveaways, and apart from a few cosmetic changes, they still look the same today. Even the color dialogue looks the same. Since John Knoll was working at ILM, Photoshop was immediately thrown into the deep end. It got used in all parts of the visual effects pipeline, from concept paintings and compositing, to matte paintings, set extensions, texture creation, and just plain old fixes for CG renders. Which is mainly one of the reasons Photoshop was so robust even in the very early days. It was used in one of the most demanding industries and by highly skilled people who have no time to waste and are expected to produce great results day in and day out. The first film to use Photoshop was James Cameron's Abyss. Photoshop had a more behind the scenes role there as it was responsible for the background plates the water creature was composited on. ILM wasn't fully committed yet in using digital tools, so this first experiment was a great showcase of what can be achieved. A year later it was used in Die Hard 2, in the now legendary airport end credits scene. The 35 second effect, which combined live action elements with a matte painting, worried everyone involved in the effect. It was one continuous shot that slowly zoomed out to reveal an airport runway full of airplanes, vehicles and people. 35 seconds was enough time for the audience to figure out that what they were watching might be an effect. Back then they preferred shorter effect shots closer to 3 or 5 seconds. Short enough for people to not realize what's going on. This scene ended up being a VFX shot because shooting the scene for real was not only going to be expensive but also impractical. A runway and multiple planes would have to be rented and to add to the complexity of the shot, this scene required snow and several vehicles and people walking around. 
And even if the budget allowed that, lighting this huge set at night would just be impossible. That's why it was decided to go with VFX, and more specifically a combination of a matte painting with live action elements spread out throughout the painting. Photoshop was responsible for blending all these elements together and making the necessary color corrections. This scene really pushed the hardware of the time. It was one of the most memory intensive projects. It required 14 to 15 Mac hard drives, each storing 600 megabytes of data. That's just 9 gigabytes in total, which of course in today's standards is a negligible amount. But back then it was a nightmare to handle, which goes to show how much we've progressed in these 30 years. Then came Terminator 2, the blockbuster that used every single effect in the book, from miniatures to full 3D animated characters. It was these 3D elements in particular Photoshop was used on. Instead of having to wait for days for re-renders to complete, the ILM artists realized they could just correct the effect shot by just painting out the flaws in Photoshop. As Dennis Murin recalls, if we could get a shot 90% right, our artists could take the shot, go into Macintoshes and use Photoshop to paint out the flaws. In one shot, the T-1000 runs out of an elevator and into a parking garage. Due to the extreme positions, the model's shoulders kept separating from the body. The tears lasted only a few frames, but they were visible enough to ruin the shot. The artist managed to fix that easily by painting out the gaps in Photoshop. So the shot was finished without having to re-render or having to write specialty software to circumvent the issue. As Murin says, I use this on 30% of our CG shots as our secret weapon to getting finals. Photoshop was used on plenty more ILM VFX shots. For example, on the young Indiana Jones, Photoshop was used heavily for set extensions. An art gallery is transformed into a huge museum by adding a long hallway and more paintings on the wall. In another episode, a relatively ordinary shot of a train crossing through the frame is being transformed into a big budget Hollywood shot just by adding a lavish matte painting. This bigger production value can be seen once more in another set extension. This time a building in Prague is made to look like the Spanish writing school in Vienna, which was the original intended location. Photoshop was also heavily used in the concepting phase. For example, in Death Becomes Her, instead of relying on sketches that are always open to interpretation, ILM concept artists used Photoshop to nail down the look of the effect. But VFX is not the only thing Photoshop is used for. Almost immediately after its release, Photoshop took the pre-press and graphic design world by storm. Nowadays it's the industry standard in graphic design, and even competing programs have to support the PSD format. Throughout the years, the team behind Photoshop kept adding feature after feature, so nowadays it's quite difficult to find something that the program cannot do. Even though some users are disappointed with Adobe's decision to go the subscription route, competitors are still not as feature-rich as Photoshop. Affinity Photo, for example, has a good feature set, but it cannot compete with more than 30 years of development. One would argue that as long as the basics are there, you don't need much more, but even if you will use a certain feature only a handful of times, it's good to know that the application you use day in and day out has you covered. I've witnessed this several times in my career. I went months or even years without using a specific feature, but when the time came, I was glad that it was there. So for me at least, Photoshop and also Illustrator will always be part of my toolset. It's interesting to go back though and think of the earlier days where Photoshop wasn't as feature complete. For example, Layers, Photoshop's most revolutionary feature, came in 1994 with version 3. Now it's hard to think of an image editor without this basic feature, but until then users had to rely on separate files to store different elements of their artwork. Smart Objects and Adjustment Layers is another set of really important non-destructive tools that came in a lot later. Smart Objects specifically came around 2005. I remember wishing for a feature like that, and when it finally came out, I immediately started using it. But not everything has to be about the big features. Even small improvements made a huge impact. For example, the stamp tool for years was one of the clunkiest tools to use. It didn't have any preview, so when you were cloning something, you were kind of guessing where a specific part of the image will fall. I don't remember exactly when that feature was introduced, but I guess it was around 2007. What I do remember though, was that it came relatively late in Photoshop's development. 
I could go on and on about these uh, small improvements, but you get the point. When you live through these changes, you don't realize the impact they have in your day-to-day -day work. It's only when you go back and use an older version that it hits you. And that's what I absolutely love with both Photoshop and Illustrator. Even though both programs are extremely feature rich, the team behind them always keeps improving and adjusting things. Of course, it's not all sunshine and roses. There are a ton of bugs introduced along the way, especially the past couple of years, but I've never felt like I couldn't do my job because a feature is completely broken. What's so bad about monkeying with the photograph and putting himself with Ronnie and Nancy? Well, the thing is that photographs we still tend to believe as a society, if an eyewitness says they saw something, we might say maybe they're wrong, maybe a government denies it, it's one person's word against another, but when you see a photograph, you really tend to believe it, that something happened, and I think that document in our society is, is extraordinarily important, and when people start monkeying with photographs, you don't know which photographs are real, which ones happened, which didn't, and you think, for example, of Tiananmen Square, the Chinese government said nothing happened, and the photograph said, no, there was a massacre. Mm -hmm. People said, yes, there was a massacre, a photograph against a government, and the photograph won. I think at this point we should also discuss some of the negative impact Photoshop has had in today's society. Even back then, in that first Today Show segment, they touched on what it means to not know what is real and what is not. What they didn't know back then, though, was how big Photoshop's impact would be on the way men and women perceive beauty. Media and magazines in particular go to great lengths heavily altering proportions, skin color, and skin imperfections, creating a new reality that is attainable only with tools like Photoshop. Both designers and companies are mostly to blame here. It's easy when you're working on an image or a campaign to focus on building the ideal perfect look, the ideal sales pitch without realizing, though, the impact of your actions. There's been many campaigns throughout the years trying to highlight the issue, but unfortunately, heavy photo editing still persists to this day. Especially now, when we all have access to photo editing tools right on our phones. Photo editing, though, goes even further than that. Even our food hasn't escaped these insane beauty standards. Most food photography is heavily edited in an effort to create the most appetizing shot. For a while, even McDonald's run a campaign trying to explain why their product shots look so different than the actual product. I think John Knoll, one of the creators of Photoshop, put it best. In the end, it's up to us to apply ethics, not the tool. No tool has ethics built into exactly. it. Exactly. A, a hammer doesn't have ethics built into it. It's, and you can use a hammer to, to do something wonderful. You can use a hammer to do something really bad. And uh, Photoshop is, uh, is like any other tool in that respect. That, uh, that uh, and I, I'd like to, to focus on all the, the really amazing and beautiful things that people do sure. with it. But uh, certainly there's a, there's a dark side. There are people that, that use it for... Uh, uh, I think uh, damaging and unethical things, and I think it's, it's, you know, it's contingent on the artist to apply the ethics. Despite all these things, Photoshop is an amazing tool that completely transformed the graphics landscape. And I'm sure the Null brothers feel incredibly rewarded when they see all sorts of beautiful pieces of art made with their creation. I certainly would be. And with that, we've reached the end of this video. I would be interested to hear your thoughts about Photoshop and what was the first version you've ever used. Let me know in the comments below. Take care, and I'll see you in the next one.